excited. Uh, this story was not, as you might know us old folks, uh, part of the regular lectionary that we have in the new revised common lectionary because it has a woman in it. And all those stories of women were kind of, oops, left out of the common lectionary. So in year B, we get all the juicy ones. And this little story that we have about Esther is the whole reason for existence is to explain the feast of Purim. And Purim is like our Mardi Gras or like our pancake supper. Before we go into Lent, we celebrate the freedom we have in loving Christ and eating whatever we want to eat and uh, basically drink lots of wine. <laughs> At least in the South we did drink lots of wine. <laughs> um, so the party itself is two days long, and some of that is spelled out in the actual writing, uh, because a hazardous, and you did good job, a hazardous, <coughs> how would you know that? And that's not even sure how they say it, and they're not even sure he existed, but his name in the story is a hazardous, and Haman is the bad guy, so the Jewish people, when they hear this, kids and the adults alike are taught to stomp the floor and ring this ratchety noisemaker every time the word Haman comes up in the story. So you're all listening for Haman to come up and stomp, stomp, run, 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 run. Uh, Everybody dresses in costumes because Esther's identity was hidden from the king. She did not, he did not know that she was Jewish. She hides her identity and then lets it be known. And this is the only time she talks in the story. You got it in today's gospel reading. I read it our readings today, first reading. She talks and what she says is quite profound. She's full of wisdom and guts and courage to go, A, into the king's presence without being summoned was forbidden. So she knew she was risking death to even step into the gate that led to the palace where he was sitting on his throne in the doorway watching who comes in and out of that gate. So the minute she stepped in the gate in the palace property, he could have he could have had her killed but she just stood there meekly uh, before she has all these words to say she says very little she is brought up as a good Jew in Mordecai's household because her parents died we don't know how Mordecai was a cousin of her or is a cousin of her deceased father so she, it's a cousin it's a relation and she grows up as a beautiful child as a docile child, as a quiet child. So we don't hear anything other than she's good and a little bit like Mary is talked about in our Christian Testament. She's just careful and reads and is very quiet. And it's, these things rest in her heart where she learns her wisdom. Until she comes out with this profound thing. So the build up to this story is full of melodrama with lots of evil things happening and a really ridiculous king who doesn't make any decisions on his own. Whatever people tell him, he says, oh, that's a good idea, we'll do that. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea, we'll do that. <laughs> and, oh, he doesn't say he's sorry ever, and he never says anything kind or wise. So he's kind of the buffoon. So the king is the buffoon, Haman is the bad guy. <clears throat> Haman is descended from Esau, so the story goes. Um, this has also been worked on by discussion and uh, holy gatherings of men, Jew people, <laughs> who uh, will decide what this stuff really means. I'm just sticking with what's in the Hebrew Testament. It does say that Mordecai uh, faithfully raised his daughter and that once she is taken as one of the beautiful members of the harem, so this is all about what happens in harems, leave your imaginations to do what they do, <laughs> because she was selected as a beautiful virgin to go into the harem, she gets a year of training of how to be the consort of the king, a hazard, the idiot. <laughs> so a, a year is spent on cosmetics only. Uh, I think it went something like nine months cosmetics and three months um, just learning how to be docile and sexy. <laughs> so this is the training that she gets is to be part of the harem, and she obviously learns well because out of all of this group of people, she is chosen to be the new queen. 
Now you might wonder who the queen was before she ascended to the throne. This is very interesting too. The queen who preceded her was called Vashti. She was Persian, as is Ahasuerus, as is everybody in this story. It's a Persian story, and it talks about the Jews who are in the Persian diaspora, which is where they got taken to Babylon, and a lot of them stayed, and it was just the Jew population spread all over the East. This Persian kingdom that we're talking about at the time went from the valleys of Pakistan down into the Sudan in Africa. Huge kingdom. And there's Jews all over it. So this story gives some pride to the Jewish diaspora because the temple is never mentioned. The Bible is never mentioned. The Lord God is never mentioned. It's kind of a little risque story that slipped under and mm -hmm. has been part of the canon of books in the Hebrew scripture for so long, they don't know exactly how it got there. But it's there, <laughs> and the diaspora Jews love this story because it raises them up, and especially the women, because Vashti does a very brave thing. <clears throat> this is allergies. <laughs> I slept with them in Crescent City a lot. <laughs> I'm not sick. Uh, so Vashti was doing the right thing in her uh, harem. The, uh, what do they call that where the harem all lives? It has a name. But they have the, the place where they live. What's the Rambi? Oh, I, see, I don't know that word, but thank you. <laughs> I thought I might know it. <laughs> um, she's having a feast for the women. While outside, Ahasuerus is having this boisterous feast for the men that lasts 350 days. Oh my. Yes. And what he does is display all the riches of his kingdom, his linen, his wool, his silver, his wine, uh, the food. Uh, and then when they're really drunk after 350 days of drinking and partying, they decide they want to ogle the queen. And they, the king, Ahasuerus, calls for Queen Vashti to come out of her quarters where she's doing the right thing with her women, preparing. But not for this, to be paraded around the other men. That's a very uh, shame-filled thing for her to do. So out of her dignity, she refuses. And that doesn't sit well with Ahasuerus. And Ahasuerus has Haman's ear. Uh, Haman tells him what to do we need to uh, get rid of her. Actually, there's another aide that got rid of her. You need to banish her from your kingdom. She's not following your orders. She called, I believe, three times, and she refused three times. If you were Vashti, you would have done the right thing. But Esther knows this going into it. She knows that when she may be struck dead just walking into the gate of the throne, she knows that it happened to her predecessor, to Vashti. So when she finds out that she is picked in the harem, she does everything she's told, just like she was raised by Mordecai. She does the cosmetics. She learns the sexy moves. And when she is called into the king, she does what she does. And her charms were so great that she becomes the queen, and she knows this may not last. While she's being the queen, her uncle Mordecai comes and sits by the gate every day to get the news of what's going on with his charge. He knows that she is Jewish. Nobody else knows. That she could get caught at any time. He knows that nobody else knows. So what happens is that when Esther gets her one request, she is taking a message from Mordecai to the king himself because the message is that Ahasuerus has been listening to Haman Haman, rattle, stomp, stomp. <laughs> Haman has decided to eliminate all the Jews because of Mordecai. <clears throat> Mordecai won't bow when Haman walks by. Haman is, you know, a little egotistical. Haman's not the king. <laughs> Haman is the advisor to the king. <clears throat> we'll just keep talking and it will move along. <clears throat> Voice. No, it won't help. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, where was I? Mordecai finds out that Haman has plotted with Ahasuerus to get rid of all the Jews. 
And the reason it's called Purim is that they throw the dice, which is a purr. They throw the purr, <coughs> which lands on this big circular calendar on the month of Adar. Adar is the month he decides they will die. In our time, this, uh, the last Purim was February 25th and 26th of this last year. I don't know it for year 22 coming up. But uh, that's what they still celebrate. Anyway, they would kill all the Jews in, in Persia, which is a lot of Jews, and it's a lot of land, and it's like the whole diaspora. It includes Egypt, even. So he writes a letter, gives to a courier that gives it to Esther. Esther writes a response, no way can I do this. I will get killed. He writes another letter to a courier who delivers it to Esther and says, you have to do this for the Jewish people. This is your moment. So she obeys. She's obedient. She's like Mary. Big things come her way. And she says to the king, I get two. I get a, a request and a, I forget a garage. She has two questions she gets to, two requests. The first one I ask for my life. The second one I ask for the, the Jewish people. And of course, Ahasuerus doesn't even know who she's talking about, but the people he's about to kill are all Jews, and that she herself is Jewish. All of this comes out. She says it without hiccuping, without stuttering, and without being shy. She just lays it out there. And he said, my lovely wife, your wish is granted. Part of Haman's plan was to kill all the Jews. So in retribution, uh, the Jews kill all of Haman's uh, army. So ratchet, ratchet, stomp, stomp. He's dead. They kill him and put him on a, it's about as tall as the redwood trees here. They, they impaled him on a, 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 a spike that was that tall, as tall as a redwood tree or a five-story building. It's an exaggeration. But everything <laughs> in the story is an exaggeration. The, the moral of the story is women come to the rescue more often than not. No. <laughs> <laughs> But this particular woman and Vashti come out shining in this story, and so does Mordecai. And Mordecai indeed ends up a very rich man and uh, a part of the, um, of the palace staff. This story has reminiscences to Daniel. It was written about the same time as Daniel, has the excitement of a campfire story, like that story in Daniel. And it, it also has reminiscences of Joseph in Egypt, um, rising up to the top and being part of the Pharaoh's team. So it's a very beloved story. And Purim is one of the favorite holidays of Jews. And the kids especially love it because you get to, get to have jokes on your friends and you get to wear costumes and you get to make noise. And there's lots of candy. They give gifts to people and they help the poor. So that's the moral of the story. Amen. <laughs>